behalf of the Networking and Information Technology Research and Development Program, um, including our director, uh, Keith Mazzullo, and our FASTER uh, activities, um, I'm Bob Chaddock. It's my privilege to, uh, to welcome you all this afternoon to a, um, what I think will be a fabulous and energetic presentation uh, from Dr. Francine Berman, uh, contributing to the developments of the Research Data Alliance and basically a, a perspectives on uh, global activities contributing to uh, spur the developments of infrastructure and, and community activities for the global sharing of research data. This is a, 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 a fabulous ongoing energetic activity uh, that, is, that is led in the United States by uh, Dr. Berman, but her leadership and her energies are clearly a catalyst for a set of, of global activities that contribute to the efforts to develop cyber infrastructure for broadly sharing data for research, for education, for engineering, for economic development, for multiple purposes. It's a privilege to, uh, to be able to, uh, to introduce Fran and to join you all this afternoon. For those of you that are joining us by the web, uh, you, the, um, the microphones uh, from you all are basically currently muted. But be assured that as the afternoon progresses, we will welcome your discussions as well. This is simply a technical constraint of the, um, of the WebEx and the NSF network. So be assured we know you're out there. So with that, Fran, it's a privilege to join you and welcome you back to the National Science Foundation. We welcome your thoughts, please. Are we good? Um, with that introduction, I feel that I should be taller, but uh, um, uh, thank you very much, Bob, and, and oh, this one. Uh, thank you very much, Bob, and I really appreciate being invited. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today, and uh, I also appreciate your attention. I know this is a very busy time of year for you all, so thanks a lot for making the time. Um, I wanted to fill everybody in with um, the current trajectory of the RDA, the Research Data Alliance. Research Data Alliance is, uh, this time three years ago, there was a lot of discussion within the uh, National Science Foundation and um, across the world about um, community-driven efforts um, towards research data sharing uh, and exchange and the need for um, more and more coordinated infrastructure for that purpose. And so about this time last year and, um, and a month from now, there were eight people on the phone from three regions of the world, uh, uh, from Europe, from Australia, and two of us were from the U.S. Um, today, um, the Re Research Data Alliance has 3,000 members from 103 countries, and um, the trajectory has been um, unanticipated, precipitous, and truly exciting. So I wanted to give you a sense about where we're at, where we're going, what we've been doing, and uh, welcome all of your thoughts and participation as well. And so, so here's the outline of today's talk. And um, I wanted to start with um, some time at the beginning to talk about, you know, what problem does RDA solve? You know, why did the organization come about in the first place? Why did uh, the community and, uh, you know, worldwide see a need for something like the RDA? Then I want to talk uh, quite a bit on what's the RDA doing? Um, what did we mean to produce? What are we producing? How do we get together? And then at the end of the talk, I want to spend a few minutes on um, what we're doing in the U.S. around RDA and um, a little bit about what's on the horizon. So that's what to expect. And we're just going to start with what's the problem? What is the problem that RDA solves? And so this is the problem that I think all of you are, um, I'm sure, extremely familiar with in your domain, data sharing. How do we get more data out there? How do we get it to be useful and usable by the community? And how do we get it to be um, the spur for innovation 
that uh, we believe that it is. We live in the 21st century. Um, we have gone in many areas of endeavor from information poor to information rich, and making that information useful and usable is really important. And, and you could all put um, headlines um, from any one of your communities on this, whether you're looking at um, uh, the health sciences and the importance of having bigger populations so you can look at trends from noise analyses, uh, whether you're looking for agricultural productivity, whether you're looking at physics, whether you're looking at the humanities, whether you're looking at um, uh, biology and chemistry, all of these uh, areas are increasingly data-driven. So sharing that data and actually using data from other communities in unanticipated ways is turning out to create new forms of innovation. So let me give you an example. Let's talk about asthma. Asthma is a common disease. It uh, disproportionately uh, young adults and children are at risk for asthma. Um, we expect about 400 million people worldwide to have asthma by 2025. And in fact, asthma is interesting in that there are many social and environmental factors that have to do with your risk for asthma. So say I wanted to ask the question, am I more at risk to get asthma if I live in New York City than if I live in Mexico City? And um, so here's what some researchers are doing to think about this. Um, uh, this slide was given to me by a digital anthropologist, someone who is taking a very holistic view about all of the factors that could come into asthma. So um, this group is looking at um, patient records from hospitals in various uh, places. Um, they're looking at um, information about asthma itself and the, and the way the disease uh, uh, moves forward and how it affects people. They're looking at air quality data and where are infrastructure, where's factories, where's air pollution. Um, they're looking at patient um, uh, interviews uh, with people who are healthcare professionals, and they're getting a very, very holistic view. Now, say I want to ask this question about New York City and Mexico City or uh, Bogota, Colombia or Los Angeles, California or any place that you want to look at um, this kind of question. And one thing you might want to do is you might want to get a patient record and, uh, and of course, the patient lists their address, you know, 123, uh, you know, Morningside Lane or whatever uh, on that record. You want to match that perhaps with something about the air quality around where they are, and so the location might be GPS coordinates. You might want to look at their economic status. You might know that, uh, get some data that says in their area of the city, um, the average economic uh, salary, the average salary for family is a certain thing, and maybe that gives it to you by neighborhood or by town. Well, if you think about it, there's a piece of infrastructure you need to have in order to harmonize those addresses. In the absence of getting the patient record people and the air quality people and the economic people to all use the same metadata category to talk about where things are, um, you need a little piece of infrastructure that allows you to take the town, find the address, um, uh, take the GPS coordinate, and tell you where the same place is. And so that piece of infrastructure, that thing that enables you to share data, between one community and another, extremely important piece of infrastructure. And in fact, without that infrastructure, now you're spending your time on the technology instead of the question, instead of mining the data. So that infrastructure is important. So data sharing is important for many communities. Infrastructure is important for data sharing. So um, now think about this example we just talked about. and. Um, one of the things that it brings to mind is the point that just making this avail uh, data available is not good enough. Knowing where the air quality, where to find the air quality data, you know, we have that, we have the patient data, um, we have the um, economic data, they're all available, but that doesn't solve my data sharing and my research problem. And so, um, you know, data isn't, isn't useful to me if I can't analyze it in, in some reasonable way. So I need to have infrastructure and able to do the analysis. It's not an asset if I don't have metadata in the first place. 
I need to understand the difference between the address of the patient and their temperature coming into the hospital. Metadata has to enable me to do that. If I can't find the data in the first place, it's not useful to me either. You know, it's out there, but I can't use it for the thing uh, that I want. And of course, um, these days we're highly concerned um, about reproducibility of results. So say these researchers take um, this data, they write a paper about it, then I want to go back and look at their data and maybe I want to add uh, the data from my locale, you know, London, England. I want to add it from uh, Troy, New York. Um, so what I want to do is I want to, first of all, have the data be there. So somebody needs to have um, been its steward and made sure that there was data preservation so that data is still there. And now I also want to make sure that I'm using the data that the original data used by the researchers. So if this is an evolving data set, if it's a data set that's been corrected, new stuff has been put in it, it's, it's been growing, um, I want to make sure I'm doing an apples to apples kind of comparison. So all of those things, all of those things require pieces of infrastructure. And the infrastructure is really important in order uh, to help us share data. So what kind of infrastructure is needed? And it turns out that in the data sharing, world, we need the same kind of infrastructure that we need in real life. So, you know, in real life, um, uh, we generally cannot rely on there to be a universal solution to many of the problems that we have. So if the problem that I have is I want to go to uh, any hotel room uh, in the world and I want to read my email, um, you know, I don't need to wait for the plug community to get together and um, have a universal flower system and a universal size, shape, color of plug so I can bring that with me, I bring my plug adapter. And my plug adapter allows me to interoperate between different systems. It's a solution that I can do right now uh, while we wait for the plug community to come together. Um, that's true of uh, common standards and metadata, too. That's a piece of social infrastructure. It requires agreement and adoption from a variety of people. But if I want to build something and I go to Home Depot, I don't just get the lumber they feel like cutting that day at the shape or size that they have. You know, we have common standards that the construction industry has developed, of, you know, the screws and the lumber and all the kinds of things that we use in building, and they enable us to use these as components that can, can come together. That doesn't uh, say that we don't often uh, use custom things for custom problems. but. Common standards, metadata allow us to use sort of common frameworks for common problems. That's important in the data world so that, you know, when I think about length, if there's agreement in my community that length means inches and not centimeters, that means that I'm less likely to get into error. Um, policy turns out to be tremendously important, um, uh, and especially to this group. You know, the policy that's put in place changes the way people behave. So when the National Institutes of Health um, started saying that um, if you receive funding for a certain kind of work and it's relevant, we need you to put that into the protein data bank or into the Alzheimer's uh, data collection or something like that, it really enabled a community for whom their data is often a competitive advantage if you don't share it, to share the data. And then you have a much broader, much more valuable data collection um, that people can use. So it turns out that policy about data sharing is tremendously important and can help your communities really get the data out there in some appropriate way. Um, that's also true of practice. Communities come up with their own practice. And, um, you know, to me, this, the, uh, the excellent example is driving. The motor vehicle code tells us, you know, when we're supposed to stop the car and who has the right of way, but it certainly does not cover every instance that you see as you drive around. So the community comes together with practice that complements the policy um, with the point of view of trying to get, you know, the minimal possible uh, accidents. Practice is important. Again, that's a piece of social infrastructure. Um, economics. Infrastructure uh, is often not noteworthy uh, while it works. Um, you're not going to think about the fact that the lights were on and the power was going. Somebody paid that bill and somebody is making sure it's not noteworthy. It will be noteworthy if it goes away. And, um, and so oftentimes these things are very hard to fund and hard to prioritize because 
you don't get the big breakthrough. It's not a breakthrough that the lights stayed on in the room uh, during this talk. But we can't have the talk without the lights and without um, uh, all of the rest of the stuff, or it's much harder. So sustainable economics, you know, you have to make sure that the buses run. You have to make sure that someone's paying the bus driver, um, et cetera, to make them on time. And then finally, but certainly last but not least, you know, we live in a technology-driven world. Um, some of these technologies are really easy to use. Some of these technologies are really hard to use. And it's really important that we have an increasingly data-savvy, technology-savvy population all over the world because, uh, you know, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, technology is here. Uh, it can be used as a great force of good. It can sometimes be used not for good. And uh, the more we know about it, the better we are. So um, the message here is that the data world is not unlike the world we live in every day. It needs certain kinds of technical infrastructure. It needs certain kinds of social infrastructure. It needs a um, workforce that understands uh, the infrastructure. It needs um, financial support for that infrastructure. And all of that is really important when we start thinking about data sharing and the building and development of infrastructure. Now, um, you know, we might think, okay, you know, we got data sharing. We know that's uh, really pushing us forward. Um, we've got infrastructure. We know we need that in order to do data sharing. How come, you know, are we there yet? And, and the fact is we're not quite there yet, and why? And it turns out that, you know, as you all know, um, at a time when dollars are scarce and priorities are many, it is very difficult to – um, prioritize the effort and the uh, investment needed uh, for infrastructure. Tremendously important and, um, and tremendously hard. And this is one of my favorite, you know, headlines, um, you know, in the Northeast, which uh, Washington uh, counts. Uh, I think uh, for the most part we've had tremendously severe winters. And um, I saw this great headline by the mayor of Syracuse who said, you know, you often overlook prioritization and investment in infrastructure, but, you know, you don't cut new ribbons for water mains, but that's what really matters. You know, Syracuse cannot operate without water. Um, all the cool things that you want to do in Syracuse can't happen, uh, essentially, without water, but the water mains are hard to get funded, and I think this is our um, problem in a nutshell in the data community is prioritization of these data sharing efforts. Um, prioritization of the infrastructure needed for it in all possible ways, in effort and investment, et cetera. Now, finally, you know, what do we do to get kind of get around this? What do we do to up the priority of infrastructure? And it turns out that um, organized efforts can really help. And if you think in the, uh, you know, so science community broadly read, you know, there's a number of sort of high-profile efforts where people have really made a difference. So, you know, start with the protein data bank. When NIH created some social infrastructure, created some policy, and science and nature followed on um, to say that, look, if you've received federal money to do this kind of work, put the, put the results of that work in a place where the community can see. And the protein data bank represents billions of dollars of efforts, tremendously important to the community, 24-7, uh, uh, been around for tens of years, 40 years, 50 years, and really important. And so, you know, the more we can um, create policy that helps us get our data out there, um, the better. Um, high energy physicists, you know, without the Large Hadron Collider, uh, multinational effort uh, for the physics community, high energy physics community worldwide, um, we wouldn't have the, you know, very spectacular results that have resulted from it. This is the level of investment that nobody can do by themselves. So when we gather together, we can actually get organized to make things happen. Um, astronomy is another good example. So in this case, uh, the hardware was the enabler, and the data um, from the Large uh, uh, Hadron Collider, even though we throw away a lot of it, um, the data has really helped us for big new discoveries. Um, astronomy is another really great example of this. The community came together around common practice and metadata standards for all of the large-scale telescopes and sky surveys around the world. How do you slice them and dice them in a way that um, all of that information can be used uh, in coordination with each other, and how do you make it available to everyone through the Internet? 
And uh, this is something that the astronomy community has been able to do, and it's been a great boon for the field. So these things really make these fields better. They make innovation better. Um, they make us more able to, uh, to um, really go forward. So, um, you know, what's, what, you know, so why RDA? You know, where, where did, what problem does RDA solve? Well, uh, data sharing is a really good technique for us to really capture some of the assets of the 21st century and the tools that we need to solve problems. Infrastructure, really important for data sharing. Um, and oftentimes, infra because infrastructure is oftentimes deprioritized, these organized community efforts can really get it to a higher level of prioritization, higher effort, higher energy behind it. So, um, so let me talk a little bit about the RDA and how it's trying to address that particular problem, infrastructure for data sharing. RDA doesn't solve everybody's problem, but the, the point is to really try to address this problem in a really good way. And uh, so what is the RDA? RDA is a research data alliance, is um, an organization. Its uh, mission is to build the social and technical, so that includes policy, practice, code, um, a variety of tools, a variety of other things, infrastructure that enable data sharing. And the vision is that if we lower the barrier of access, we create more good, useful uh, data infrastructure, and we coordinate when possible. We're not building the universal Esperanto data infrastructure of the world, but the idea is that we coordinate when possible so people can create synergies. That's really important. Um, so that's what the Research Data Alliance is trying to do. Um, so it's really a very pragmatic, or, pragmatic organization. Um, People come, you know, 3,000 people so far have come to solve problems and just facilitate progress. And so what do they do in the Research Data Alliance? They come as um, uh, the big body of members come in kind of two forms, interest groups and working groups. So the interest groups get together, and there's a problem they want to solve. And what they want to do is, is discuss with each other what are the best approaches to try to solve that problem. So they'll spend some time thinking about um, what kind of infrastructure needs to be built. And when they have a clear idea, um, they submit a proposal to be a working group. Working groups are short-term. Uh, they do what they do in 12 to 18 months. They build a piece of infrastructure. Embedded in those working groups are people who use the infrastructure. It is not built, and they will come. The idea is that, that uh, a certain group of people need the infrastructure. Um, a certain group of people will use the infrastructure, and then the idea is that the infrastructure um, should be more broadly useful and available to everyone. Um, so you see right now we have about 60 groups uh, in the RDA. Um, typically you have much fewer working groups and much shorter term. Um, uh, we have currently about uh, 17 working groups or 18. We have about 40-something interest groups. Um, and, uh, and, and these are all community driven. No one tells anybody what to work on. People come to RDA because they think RDA will be a useful vehicle for the work they do and the things they care about. Um, and, and so, um, you know, and we welcome anyone uh, in the data sharing community uh, who would like RDA um, to serve that role for them. The culture of RDA focuses on the pragmatic. And so, um, as I said, uh, the working group must incorporate in adopters, and we go through sort of a three-level um, vetting process for working groups. You know, almost anyone can become an, infra interest, uh, an interest group um, if it's relevant to uh, the data community. But for a working group, um, there's a community assessment and comment, there is a technical assessment and comment, and then there is a council, so the leadership council assesses it to make sure that it will be useful. There's gotta be adopters in the working groups, otherwise it doesn't get to be a working group. Um, the infrastructure has to solve somebody's problems. So um, the groups come together because you have a problem for which infrastructure is needed. And so um, uh, it doesn't have to be everybody's problem, but it does have to be somebody's problem. So the idea is that the group comes together solves that, uh, that problem through the development of infrastructure, and then everyone moves on. If the researchers now have that problem solved, they're moving on in their work. Maybe there's some other problem they need solved. Maybe there's some other, uh, other community that needs that kind of infrastructure 
uh, et cetera. Um, RDA is a very agile organization uh, by uh, purpose. Um, the idea is to um, uh, really think carefully and use best practices of other organizations to try to develop ourselves, which we did. We looked a lot on um, uh, the IETF. We looked a lot at the you know smart grid interoperability panel. We looked a lot about a lot at a lot of organizations out there, and tried to think what really works for those communities, and what do we maybe want to avoid because we don't think it works for the kind of organization we want to have. Um, we put all of those things together for the initial set of processes and procedures for the RDA, and now we're getting experience with them. Some of them are working pretty well, great. Uh, some of them working not so well, and so we're changing them. So the idea is, you know, try stuff um, and uh, and see what works for the RDA and what's not. And the community is very involved in that whole trajectory, and, and it's really important. If we want to keep getting iteratively better and more impactful as an organization, we have to be agile. Um, it's also important for the, uh, the community, for the governance structure to be, you know, pretty lightweight. Um, so the idea is this is not a group where – um, you spend a lot of time thinking about which committee you're in and, uh, uh, you know, what title that you have. People want to go to the RDA, get some work done. Um, so we really have a pretty lightweight uh, organizational structure, and I'll show you that in, uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, technology neutrality is really important for RDA. We are not a, a platform for a particular group or particular project to say this is the way everybody should do things. Um, what we want to do is get some solutions on the table for people who have needs for infrastructure, and if there are other ways of solving that or other um, approaches, that's, that's fine, too. The idea is to get stuff done. Um, and then, of course, we want to amplify the impact uh, when possible. Um, uh, if uh, We are having some really interesting experience um, over the last year with now that we have our first deliverables, um, can other people use those deliverables other than the people who are in the, in the groups? And what does it take for them to do that? Do they need uh, to uh, adapt the deliverables in terms of um, creating a little bit of extra, you know, software or code or uh, instantiation in some way? Um, what happens to sort of maintain uh, those over time, et cetera? So the idea is to amplify the impact of the deliverables when possible and to collaborate with organizations. So. Um, RDA is not looking for world domination. We're looking to um, really support other kinds of organizations doing other kinds of things. Data world's a big world, not going to be one organization. We have a role to play, and we want to really help others be effective in playing their own roles. So it's a very – I'm trying to kind of give you a flavor of the um, culture of RDA. It's been very pragmatic, um, pretty agile. Um, a lot of enthusiasm within the organization because a lot of people have infrastructure needs. And, and it's sort of thrilling to go to a, uh, these plenaries, which are twice a year, which are interdisciplinary people from all over. We've got, you know, marine biologists and librarians and information scientists and chemists and policymakers and computer scientists and all kinds of people who come to these. Um, they are uh, – international, people from countries all over the world. They are intergenerational. Um, it's really important for us that students and early career professionals and people at the beginning of their years are very involved in the RDA. Um, so you find a, a wide spectrum of people. Um, so the idea is that RDA really provides um, this kind of environment to get things done. Um, uh, this is not a, uh, an eye chart. Uh, apologies for the small font, but I wanted to just give you a flavor of um, the groups that the community think that um, RDA is a good vehicle for at this point in time. And so um, we're seeing everything from a gr an interest group on reproducibility and people talking about what's needed to really make sure that data – uh, data-driven uh, publication and research is reproducible. Um, we have groups on uh, um, uh, data for development. We have groups on curriculum uh, in Africa and other places in data science. Um, we have a uh, domain repositories interest group. Uh, many of the – about two dozen of the big um, domain repositories in the U.S. and elsewhere have been coming together around best practice and the kind of infrastructure where they can share information with each other and look at issues um, really specific to domain repositories 
that includes sustainability, but that includes also um, uh, in terms of their own infrastructure. The libraries are coming together and using the RDA, so that's important. I thought I would give you a little view of what one of the groups is doing, and I thought uh, this is the group that brought us asthma, uh, the asthma problem. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about what the digital practices and history and ethnography is doing. Um, uh, this group is actually led by three people in the U.S. and um, uh, in Indiana and New York, and the focus of their group, but of course, as all uh, RDA groups, it's an international uh, group. Um, in terms of its uh, constituency. Um, the focus of this group is to advance the data standards, practices, and infrastructure for historical and ethnographic uh, research. So um, this is applicable to social sciences, to humanities, to many people who uh, don't necessarily have big data in terms of size, uh, but have data that um, they're looking for extremely nuanced relational um, uh, analyses of, and um, that are really providing very different and new tools for their communities. Um, what this group has done is it, it's done a number of um, what they call shares. And so they've done platform shares, which is them educating themselves and other people about what's going on in their various projects. So they've looked at uh, the Digital Himalaya Project, and they've had a platform share with the folks in Europe uh, doing digital humanities and um, uh, some of the folks in, uh, at MIT doing the open annotation suite. And then they're having issue shares with other kinds of um, RDA um, groups doing some of the technical things that they don't want to do from scratch. You know, they don't want to create all of the metadata categories. They don't want to create a new way of looking at data citation. Um, uh, they want to be talking to the repository people. So um, what they're doing is having these issue shares, which um, really, for them, provide a much more fertile soil in which to sort of think about the kind of infrastructure they need. Um, right now, they're adopting some of the deliverables from RDA working groups. So the practical policies uh, working group is helping them um, uh, is, uh, sort of adopt um, their policy and data management systems, which means that they don't have to uh, figure it out all by themselves. And then um, because the interest groups are really fertile places from which the working groups create, they're, they're now um, uh, preparing a submission for a working group uh, to RDA. And what they want to focus on for this particular working group, and of course they can generate as many as they like, um, is metadata for the empirical humanities. So it turns out that that's a problem they're finding as they do their work and their colleagues at the dig uh, Digital hum Himalaya and a lot of other um, areas. And what they want to do is they um, want to see if they can create a framework that they can both use themselves and share. Um, they also helped us recently, and we had a, an unbelievably great workshop at Johns Hopkins uh, University um, where they brought in a number of players from the digital humanities community. And um, with the question about, um, uh, you know, how can RDA be a vehicle to help that community build infrastructure to be able to connect them in their networks with a broader network of people doing this kind of work for which it might be helpful. So the idea is to really facilitate the kind of um, do something work that's important. Um, uh, I wanted to um, focus on our first deliverables, like our first children. Um, uh, RDA promised uh, two, two and a half years ago um, uh, when we uh, were born um, that we would have groups work for 12 to 18 months. And so our first groups um, actually delivered uh, their infrastructure in 2014, and then our second group uh, in 2015, we now have eight deliverables, so there's eight pieces of infrastructure. Um, on the left, it tells you which working group it was, and you'll notice that a lot of these are really under the hood, uh, uh, you know, uh, working groups. There, people are looking at, you know, persistent identifier information types and um, data type registries and things like that, things that are really important for your machine and your system. Uh, but are a little hard to explain to your relatives what they are at Thanksgiving dinner. Um, that being said, they're pretty important in, in terms of data sharing. Um, what you see is the deliverables, um, a little bit about the impact that the groups were hoping for, and uh, a set of adopters for each of the deliverables. 
Um, that is uh, the, the ones that were completed in fall 2014. The ones that were completed in spring 2015 are this, uh, this next group. And these, these guys started looking at a little bit more um, things that are uh, basically easier to explain for a broader audience. So um, you saw you know, folks working on metadata standards directory and data description uh, registries, interoperability. Um, what I thought I would do would actually show you a little bit, just a couple of slides each on what the data citation um, working group and the wheat data interoperability working group are doing and just give you a sense about that. But, you know, same thing. Um, what are they going to do? Um, what do they hope their impact will be? And then uh, who's adopting it? So that's going to be characteristic of our whole pipeline of deliverables as RDA moves forward. And, and um, you have, I hope, um, these little booklets um, we developed um, are to give you a bit of a sense about what the first deliverables and outcomes of RDA are. So that kind of gives you a little bit more information. Um, okay, so the Data Citation Working Group is a fascinating group. Remember we talked about the asthma folks. Um, this is being led by uh, uh, three co-chairs from Finland, Austria, and the Netherlands, and again, very international groups uh, in their constituency. And the problem is, you know, you want to deal with and refer to a data set that's growing and changing. You know, new data is coming into that data set. Um, errors are being corrected, you know, for whatever reason, uh, the data collection is reordered. And this is pretty important because you, for reproducibility, you want to identify and cite very precisely the data that you're using. You know, so I don't want to come back to it and have it be a different data set, and that kind of invalidates some of the analysis I want to do. So I want to repeat experiments, and I want to use them for uh, reproducibility. So here's what they're doing. They are focusing on uh, the problems of identifying and citing data within uh, potentially large databases, databases that evolve and change over time. And they're looking for a solution approach that is not necessarily tied to a specific technology or a specific type of database management system. It should be their recommendations are for an approach that's technology independent. And um, so what they came up with is um, 13 recommendations for um, doing a whole bunch of kinds of things. Uh, you know, they're looking at uh, data versioning and data time stamping and um, data identification. And so the 13 recommendations have to do with what steps you would go through to do that so you can cite the data in kind of a unique way. Now, notice there's a bunch of things they're not doing. Um, you know, they're not developing new persistent identifier systems. They're not developing um, new metadata categories. They're not doing new approaches to attribution. Other people are working on those problems. They want to solve a very specific, self-contained um, infrastructure problem. And they are not starting from scratch. So, you know, RDA working groups are doing what you can kind of think of as harvestable work. And in this, in this particular group, um, there was already a peer-reviewed uh, publication about um, data citation of evolving data sets. Um, it was vetted by the community. People thought it was a good idea. And they came to RDA to give them a little bit extra community, a little bit extra visibility, a little bit extra recognition that enabled them to do the work that they do. So uh, again, you know, uh, RDA is a vehicle that helps accelerate their progress. Um, here are the adopters. Um, again, it was, you know, very uh, pragmatic process, and they had a number of workshops and implementations, workshops telling people about this so people could look at adoption issues for themselves, and they've actually created some prototype solutions for a number of systems. So this, this should give you a flavor of what the working groups are trying to do. Now, I wanted to go from the technical working groups to the domain working groups, and one of my favorite uh, is the working group that just completed on wheat data interoperability. So this is uh, led by Esther and, and Richard, and they are from uh, France and Mexico, and um, work, I think, quite closely with the UN folks doing agricultural productivity, hunger, those kinds of issues. And um, of course, as we all know, uh, feeding the planet is hard. It's a really a challenge, and agricultural productivity is a really important uh, piece of it. And um, a lot of the uh, things we can do to help from the research community is to be able to look at things like 
you know, look at crops and look at the genetic makeup of that crop. And um, if I think about that in the context of a certain kind of soil, a certain kind of rainfall, certain kind of air quality, a certain kind of population, you know, how can I optimize my system to, uh, to be more productive? And so what these guys want to do is address that problem. You know, how can I put all the data I need, just like when I wanted the addresses, the addresses had to have a common vocabulary, common metadata vocabulary, or at least be interoperable. How can I put all of the data collections I need um, for these kinds of problems together? And so what they're doing is, first of all, making critical data sets for um, agricultural productivity interoperable. They're agreeing on the standards that they need, the formats that they need, vocabularies that they need, how you link data um, for this particular set of uh, issues, et cetera. So they're building a little cookbook. Um, we guys building a cookbook is kind of an interesting uh, way, but that's the way they put it, um, with recommendations and guidelines for various standards. And they're developing a prototype data collection that they're sharing with other folks around the world um, so they and using all of this kind of infrastructure uh, to enable to do this. So here's a kind of a little picture. And again, I, uh, apologies, but if you go over, if you look in the um, outputs book or the deli deliverables book and you go over to their website, you'll see much more about this. But the idea is to, you know, take the germplasm data and take the environmental data and take all of the, you know, disease data, you know, diseases that might uh, attack wheat. And, um, and um, to be able to look at these problems. Um, again, um, they are looking at um, a number of different agricultural organizations around the world um, and working with them to try to make this infrastructure available. And the, in the interesting amplification trajectory for them is if they can do this with wheat, it doesn't seem, at least to me who's not an agricultural person, you know, that far of a hop, skip, and a jump to try to do this for rice or maize or other kinds of um, uh, food uh, uh, stuff. So, um, so the idea is to really um, amplify that as, as appropriate. Um, so that kind of gives you a sense about uh, the real stuff that RDA is doing, the interest group work, uh, the working group. Another way uh, that I think RDA is really making a contribution is through its plenaries. And, um, uh, so a lot of people come to RDA. This kind of gives you, you know, on one slide um, what's happened. Our first uh, plenary RDA was launched in March of 2013. It was our very first meeting. Uh, we all met in Gutenberg, Sweden. Uh, there were 240 participants from 30 countries there, and we had our very, very first uh, official working groups and interest groups at that plenary. The second plenary was here in Washington, uh, D.C. We held it in the National Academies, which was a great venue for it. Um, we had almost 400 participants from uh, 32 countries. There are a number of people who said, you know, I, I would really like to use RDA as a vehicle. I don't know who wants to work with me on my problem. So that was a place where we tried the first birds of a feather uh, sessions. And those have proven to be really, really useful. Um, it's a way to, you know, figure out what you want to use the RDA for or get your community together. And every plenary has had kind of a first, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the tour de first uh, so far on RDA. The next plenary was in Dublin, Ireland. Um, we had nearly 500 participants from 22 countries, and we have organizational members, so organizations that want to interact with RDA, um, co-sponsor projects, co-locate meetings, et cetera, um, help in the adoption for their organizations of RDA deliverables, um, join our organizational assembly. We have the first one at Plenary 3. Um, in, uh, uh, in September 2014, um, we had the fourth plenary. We had, um, uh, you know, this has been our topmost. We had uh, uh, 550 um, oh wow, I've got, I've got our number wrong. Um, 550 participants from uh, 40 countries, um, and that was our first deliverable. So that was a very, very exciting meeting to actually, you know, we said we'd, we'd come up with deliverables. And um, my apologies, the number is wrong. We had nearly 400 people uh, in San Diego for the fifth plenaries. I think I just copied from uh, March 2013 um, uh, and forgot to change it. Um, and we had our uh, first adoption day. So this was really great. Uh, 
um, it was we got people who had not been part of the original deliverables group who had adopted RDA deliverables, and we had them share their experiences. Was this hard? Was this easy? Did you have to, you know, get extra people to do it? Um, you know, what was your experience with this? And this will help us be more effective later on. Uh, as some of you know, I was talking to Brand about this earlier, um, the next plenary, it'll be in Paris, France. Um, this is our first data challenge. And uh, the French very interested in having um, climate data. So um, they're getting some experience with accumulating lots of different data sets, doing some very interesting experimental things with it. Um, you'll notice that RDA plenaries are all over the world with 103 countries. Um, each plenary site is really inconvenient for almost everyone. Um, but what we're trying to do is sort of spread it around. And, and there's a lot of dedicated RDA members who spend uh, tens of hours on planes to get to these plenaries, and they still come. And um, so it's been a, a pretty amazing experience. Um, one of my favorite things about RDA is the co-location. Uh, many other groups, again, uh, apologies for the small font, but um, the idea is that, um, uh, you know, a number of other groups think that the RDA community is a helpful community for them. And they want to co-locate meetings because of the broad spectrum of participants. And because it is very participatory meeting, you do not come to an RDA meeting to just listen to talks, ever. You don't come to an RDA meeting to do group email. Um, you come to an RDA meeting to work. And uh, at least the half the time in all of the RDA meetings are people working in their working groups, working in their interest groups, going to other people's groups to see if there's something they can beg, borrow, or steal. And then we have great plenaries as well uh, with great speakers and, and some panels. And um, oftentimes the funders come and, and talk about what their priorities are and what the landscape looks like from their point of view, which, of course, the community is very, very interested in. But um, And then other people hold their meetings. So you get a chance to go to a meeting on data preservation or go to a meeting on um, uh, data citation. The data citation folks at Plenary 2 had kind of a little summit, a data citation summit, so that many groups working on data citation could come together, form a common agenda that helped them uh, do the things that they wanted better. So the idea is that um, RDA can really provide kind of a community town square for, uh, for the data community in an interesting way. And that's been, that's been uh, pretty interesting. So who is RDA? Um, turns out that RDA is a lot of people, and it has grown precipitously. And this has been um, a little unanticipated, um, but, uh, but kind of thrilling. Um, the last account we did, we actually uh, went over 3,000 members um, pro, uh, from 103 countries. Um, and this kind of gives you a sense about where uh, all over the world we're seeing people. And the exciting thing to me is you would expect a lot of uh, North American and um, European uh, um, uh, members of the RDA. But what we find is that the pieces of the pie from South America and Africa and Asia, Australia, et cetera, um, have been growing bigger in percentage while the pie is growing bigger. So this means that there's more traction in Africa and more traction in Asia and more traction uh, at a number of places all over the world. And that's been really exciting because um, a lot of those people bring really different problems and um, really interesting solutions and um, really expand everybody's network. If you think about it, you know, there are people that you collaborate with uh, in your normal work life, and RDA gives you an opportunity to really expand your network. Um, people doing things in uh, maybe some different ways, under different circumstances, in different countries, and the interaction with them makes your work better. And so I think a lot of people like RDA for that reason. Um, right now, about two-thirds of our members are academic. Um, we have a number of people in government laboratories and other kinds of facilities uh, from the public sector. Um, private sector is small, and that's something we would like to work on. Um, it turns out that, and we would love actually any ideas and help that all of you have, because we are always open for great advice. Um, it turns out that I think we have a stronger value proposition maybe for small and startup companies who need 
some of the infrastructure that we're building. Um, and, and so we have been exploring what the right strategy to engage in a useful way um, is. Um, and we have a lot of other people who come, policymakers and, you know, media uh, who are interested in the data world, et cetera. Um, just a little, uh, you might wonder how is RDA organized, and um, this gives you a little bit of a sense of this. Um, almost all of our membership are working hard in uh, an interest group or a working group uh, of some sort. Um, there are very few people who are coming and, uh, uh, you know, not doing anything in RDA. I mean, people really are getting involved. Um, uh, to support all of their work, uh, there are um, – uh, sort of three different constructs. Um, there is the technical advisory board, which does a lot in terms of technical vetting of working group uh, um, applications. Also interested in really providing a fabric of um, offerings uh, from RDA and trying to understand, you know, where are the holes, where are the opportunities, et cetera. This is an elected group of 12 people. Um, uh, they they spend a lot of volunteer time on that, and um, in fact, we have an algorithm that requires that that group be diverse, diverse in um, profession, diverse in geographical area, et cetera. So, you know, it's not all um, your favorite 12 librarians or something like that, although librarians are awesome and, and uh, are part of the group. Um, uh, so that's our technical advisory board. Um, we have an organizational advisory board. We now have over two dozen different organizations who have joined RDA as members. Uh, membership is um, relatively inexpensive because what we want is to um, provide a really good environment for convening the community. Um, so the fees for that for our organizational members are anything from $1,000 if you don't have very many employees to $10,000 if you have 250 or more employees. So, the, you know, a big giant company is paying uh, $10,000. And, and so now we have a number of uh, organizational members. Um, we have a very lightweight uh, administrative staff, including our Secretary General, Mark Parsons. He's actually a U.S. person, but uh, is charged with uh, overseeing the whole world of RDA. Um, each of the regions, we now have an interesting situation where each of the regions contribute staffing to the secretariat. That's because of our business model. Um, and so right now um, uh, in the U.S., um, we have several staff that both work for RDA U.S. and um, help with the secretariat. That's also true of um, Europe and Australia. Um, but it's a pretty lightweight group, so managing a community that's growing pretty fast has been uh, challenging. Um, RDA Council is our leadership group. Um, they're charged with overarching strategy and health and well-being of uh, RDA. Um, that's a group of nine people from all over the world. Um, John Wood from the UK and myself are co-chairs of that council. And we have uh, another U.S. member, Tony Hay. Uh, we have uh, Kay Rossaroka from Botswana. Uh, we have Doris Biedlich from Germany. We have Patrick Coquet. Uh, from France, we have Satoshi um, uh, Sekiguchi from Japan, we have Michael Stanton from Brazil, and I hope I'm not forgetting anyone, and John and I. Um, so it's a, it's a very international group, and, it's, um, and we get a lot done. Um, uh, you, want, you wonder about that uh, gray box. Uh, it turns out that uh, one needs a bank account, and so um, we were trying to figure out um, so, for example, if you want to collect um, dues or fees or subscriptions from your organizational advisory board, you need some place to put that. And so um, the RDA Foundation serves as a vehicle for our bank account. Uh, so it's a foundation with basically one employee, and that's our Secretary General. Um, and then uh, we have, because the public value proposition um, is really our strongest uh, value proposition um, from a financial perspective, um, we have been um, supported in terms of the RDA organization with a variety of different um, sources. Uh, currently, they include the National Science Foundation, which has been really um, uh, seminal and really helping, helping us start the RDA. NIST, which has also been extremely important. The Sloan Foundation um, funds our student programs in Europe. The European Commission funds the RDA. 
in Australia, uh, the Australian government funds the RDA, and there's a laundry list of other um, players and countries and agencies in Japan and Brazil and Canada and um, uh, South America, uh, South Africa, and other places that are that are now joining the RDA's funding forum. They're on that trajectory. So how are we doing? Uh, you know, actually, my actual job is as a professor, as Jeff knows. Uh, so, um, uh, so I can't help but giving us a little midterm um, in terms of thinking about, you know, what's our early evaluation. I'll tell you things that I think we're doing really well, and um, some places we need to to get some, uh, you know, get better at. Um, so the things that are really working well, I think, for RDA is that um, we are delivering on what we said we would do. So uh, we, we said we would build infrastructure, we said we would build community, we said we would convene community, we said people would be using this, and that's what's really happening. And um, these are early days and we hope to this uh, becomes a pipeline of infrastructure that's increasingly useful, impactful, uh, and whose reach really helped move the needle on data sharing worldwide and help us better coordinate the efforts that we do have. Um, the plenaries have, have uh, proved to be spectacular. Um, the plenaries, because they're working meetings and because people go there trying to accomplish things, um, things get accomplished. And in fact, the networks that have been built among all kinds of people who would never talk to each other, or at least not in the usual part of their life, have been really spectacular. And um, there's a number of linkages you know, intangible linkages that are being built among the community, I think I think through RDA's um, existence um, that have been really, really uh, um, very gratifying. Um, there's a bunch of things that turned out to be more complicated than we planned for, and as an agile organization, we're working on them uh, hard as we speak. Um, one of the things is, how do we maintain the relevance of the deliverables? So if you think about it, these deliverables are adopted by various groups and organizations and projects, if you want to keep building on those deliverables, making them better, more functional, making sure that changes you make are kind of consistent in some way, what kind of construct do we need to put in place so we can make sure that that's done? And so there's a big community discussion uh, in RDA to figure out how we can do that because, you know, as I said, we're a vehicle. You know, we're not storing anyone's data. We're not a funding agency. So, you know, how do we kind of um, from a volunteer community-driven organization really enable us to get the most out of our infrastructure. Um, what are the right, uh, you know, how do we deal with uh, this um, really welcome but unanticipated growth? So uh, we're a lightweight organization. We're not putting more people in the secretariat yet uh, as the community grows. So how can we make sure everybody gets the attention they need? And we're, we're really working really hard on that. Um, what are the right partnership models? And as I mentioned, um, private sector partnership is really important. A lot of those folks need to build infrastructure too. But there's intellectual pro uh, property concerns, there's customization concerns. <clears throat> and so the idea is, you know, how do we most fruitfully interact with that community in a win-win way, in a way that benefits our community and, and gives them more than, you know, a bunch of really great uh, potential employees uh, and, and something that will benefit in terms of the infrastructure as well. Um, so, um, and then the really challenging is sustainability. And as I said, um, uh, you know, um, I'll show you our business model in a, a little bit, but because we are sort of public sector, um, the value proposition for the public sector is big, and because in every country around the world, um, you know, dollars are scarce and research is important. And so um, putting money into community organizations or infrastructure turns out to be really challenging. So keeping the RDA going is this sort of lightweight group, but um, the lightweight group, you know, also have mortgages and uh, need health care and things like that. So we have to figure out how to do that. Um, just, to, just to sort of talk about um, what the emerging value proposition for RDA is, is you know, here's a value proposition for both individuals and researchers. Um, this has been a really important group for many, um, especially for our younger researchers, but even our more senior researchers. This is an expanded global collaboration network. 
and, and one that meets frequently and talks frequently, even amongst horrible time zones uh, for many. You know, there are people who get up at 3 or 4 in the morning, you know, to attend a call, but they don't have to and uh, all the time. And so it's been a great vehicle for kind of creating that network, for accelerating the development of infrastructure, for coordinating infrastructure that exists, for finding a pragmatic um, space to vet the infrastructure. It isn't I just build it and I like it and I hope you use it. It's like, you know, we build it, somebody's using it, maybe more people will use it, that's a good thing. Um, the value proposition for communities and organizations in the private sector are some opportunities to partner. And so, you know, how can we interact with other uh, people in a way that uh, benefits our organization? And for some of the organizations, many of our organizations in the Organizational Advisory Board are, you know, university centers or libraries or repositories who actually want to adopt a lot of the RDA infrastructure because that's helpful to them. They don't have to start from scratch. They get something that's being vetted in a really interesting way. So the vehicle for them helps them incorporate data sharing technologies. And finally, it's been an interesting, of course, being in the RDA gives you a chance to talk to people all over the world. And of course, everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants to be, you know, uh, competitive. And everybody wants their communities to be leading. And um, what we're finding is a lot of countries, especially third world countries and other countries, see RDA as a place to promote leadership and, um, and make sure that their research communities are competitive. We had a, um, a terrific keynote in, um, in San Diego in Plenary 5 uh, by uh, one of our Japanese colleagues who talked about, you know, what does Japan do to stay competitive? And he talked about um, the fact that the competitive countries are collaborating broadly. They have multi-author publications and they're, uh, they have authorship all over the world. You know, and how can he help his community become more competitive? So we're finding that's a value proposition. It's a value proposition for all of us in our home regions, the U.S. being our, my home region, to accelerate the development of infrastructure that helps with our national priorities. I had a great conversation, you know, earlier on with um, Renata and Brand and Bob and others about, you know, what are our national priorities and how can the RDA help us develop the infrastructure we need to solve these problems? They are problems that need solutions, and a lot of times you don't want the infrastructure to be the roadblock. Um, and it's also a great vehicle for, you know, uh, strengthening the world. And so the data community throughout the world, there are many people all over the world doing um, very important things doing some of the same things we're trying to do in their own uh, venues and knowing best practices from around the world and making those kind of connections uh, is really important. So it turns out that there is, you know, a big public sector national value proposition as well as value propositions for these other groups as well. Um, so let me end the talk, and I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, uh, with this is on what RDA US is and what specifically we're doing in this country. And then, of course, to um, invite you either in this group or in any other venue, you know, to reach out if you see RDA as a helpful space for your own communities and your own programs. And, um, and, and because that's really important to us in this region. We want to see um, things go well for the U.S. and for our own leadership and competitiveness. So, you know, first of all, what is RDA U.S.? Uh, who is RDA US? It's all the US members of RDA. Very easy. And um, right now there's about a thousand of us. I'm chair of RDA US. Um, we have a terrific uh, bunch of people in RDA US. It turns out that 50-ish um, of the people in leadership positions in RDA, co-chairs and uh, uh, various groups and on TAB and on council, et cetera, are US members. And that's a pretty uh, useful and important group. And um, it turns out that there are RDA members in all but five states. So um, we had our terrific um, graduate student residents do some data mining on the U.S. list, and it turns out that um, um, the darkest ones have the most RDA members. But we have, you know, some RDA represent uh, representation um, through, through almost every country in the U.S. 
and many, many institutions. So um, it's been really fun and interesting. And of course, it's like the Where's Waldo challenge. You know, can we get someone in Nevada to you know sign up for our union? So uh, please encourage your friends in Nevada and elsewhere. Um, uh, what are we doing? And um, one one of the things we do is we have a meeting ourselves, which we just had in uh, Troy, New York, beautiful Troy, New York, uh, in uh, in uh, May to figure out what are we doing over the next year. And so this isn't just what the RDEA office at RPI does. It's what 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 do we want to take on as a community? And so out of that workshop, there was a whole bunch of ideas. Um, here are um, you know uh, nine random ones. Um, so the student early career program, which I'll show you a slide in just a minute, is tremendously important to us. And for us in the U.S. especially, this is the next generation of leadership, and we want to raise them right. We want them to know other people around the world. We want them to uh, be well connected. We want them to be savvy about what real infrastructure is like. So it's very important for us that they're a part of this. Um, uh, we've been doing a number of outreach activities, and they include – um, workshops with data-enabled community and organizations, uh, an ambassador program, which we're going to start this year, where RDA members kind of go back into their home communities, whether they're marine biologists or whether they're chemistry, and, um, and really help um, sort of galvanize our digital humanities and, and help galvanize the community in terms of their infrastructure needs and, um, and use RDA as a vehicle if it makes sense. Um, uh, you know, don't waste time is a very important part of what we're doing. So we really want to make people's time and effort useful. Um, we've had joint partnership agreements. We actually developed a joint partnership agreement with um, Cindy last year, and we're co-sponsoring events, which is um, – and these are events that uh, hopefully um, build Cindy through the interaction with us and build RDA uh, community through uh, the interaction with Cindy. Um, and there's a number of other organizations that are – that were kind of in process um, with, we're planning for Plenary 8, which is going to be back in the U.S. That's a year from September. It's going to be, I'll tell you a little bit about it in a second, a mega big data week. Uh, we are joining with um, ICSU and uh, CoData to create a whole week long of co-located conferences. So it should be a, a really interesting week. And it's a lot of work, so we're uh, already uh, doing that. Um, one of the really important and really successful things we did last year that we want to do again is um, what we think of as adoption amplification seed projects. And these are um, uh, for the folks who are interested in using RDA deliverables um, in their own organizations and need a little help with adoption, you know, a half of a person or um, a student to help them develop the software or um, you know, some new metadata that could be added onto a particular uh, library or something like that, registry. Um, um, we are sort of providing kind of a little bit of support for that. And that's been really tremendously important and useful in terms of getting RDA deliverables um, to, you know, reach their impact uh, within the community. And so we want to keep doing that as we can. Um, there's a bunch of people interested in a testbed activity. And this should be um, ideally a really lightweight test bed. It shouldn't require you to um, download a lot of stuff and uh, um, uh, do things that are really heavyweight. It should provide um, a place for us to take the RDA deliverables, try to use them in conjunction on use cases from real activities, um, you know, try it and see kind of what you need to do and what works. And so, um, you know, a lot of these things, obviously, we can't do in a volunteer organization, but what our members will do is try to come up with cogent, sensible projects and then go out and try to get some funding for it. So this testbed will be one of them. Um, we are still, um, and, and thanks to NIST for all of their help with this, um, uh, hosting the U.S. side of these international coordination meetings. This is where the groups uh, self -or are self-organizing, the deliverables groups, and getting together and deciding, you know, if I change this thing slightly, my deliverable can work with your deliverable. So we can create a, more of a data fabric for people to use. It's not a universal data system, but it's an idea of like a little bit more coordination. And so these coordination meetings have been, you know, people not just travel to plenaries twice a year, now they want to meet in between to really get stuff done. So that's been great. And then, of course, um, 
you know, stay tuned. We'll have our first RDA US website to tell you more about this. Uh, we hired a communications person last year, uh, and and so that's being developed. And the idea is to sort of be a one-stop place for all things about RDA US, and then provide a pass through the RDA website as needed uh, when you want to go and do um, the working group and the interest group uh, coordination over there. So this is like just gives you a little bit. Um, uh, I, I, I can't do an RDA talk without telling you about these amazing uh, students that are passing through this. And um, to me, this has been a real success of RDA, not just these uh, amazing people. The woman in the green is our RDA US resident who's worked on the leadership team doing all kinds of really important stuff and generated that cool map, Candace Lanius, um, uh, who is a grad student getting her PhD. And um, the idea is, um, our student early career programs, the focus of them is to expand and strengthen all of these students' networks, to build a generational pipeline, because the fact is um, we really need people to get experience with different uh, parts of the pipeline and to build linkages in communities, because a lot of these students come from vastly different scope of things. Um, we've had funding for these students through two amazing um, sources. Um, in the NSF RDA organizational grant, um, we had funding for a two-year pilot, and that pilot, we were able to have a number of um, RDA US fellows and interns. They worked with interest groups and working groups. We sent them to plenaries. They had poster sessions. They got to know the community. They participated in various things. And when the pilots were over, um, RDA US uh, members Beth Playley and Kathy Fontaine from uh, RPI and Ina Cooper um, wrote a grant to the Sloan Foundation and Josh Greenberg from the Sloan Foundation um, uh, uh, was able to fund the program. So we went from the pilot to the program. It's a much bigger program, more students, more engagement with working groups and interest groups, um, more of a cohort building activity. Uh, than we did with the pilot, but the pilot gave us really valuable experience with this. And so there's been this kind of outreach to the community because these are really important folks uh, in our community and we want to really make sure that um, they're an important part of it. Um, if you're curious, uh, here's, how we're, here's how we support ourselves. Um, uh, with uh, um, uh, great belief in our uh, potential from NSF, um, we started in FY uh, 2012 with uh, the first grant. Um, that was a three-year grant. We think of that as RDA-1. That's just ending now. And um, that supported the organizational part, secretariat, um, organization, um, uh, sending people to plenary. Sending people to Japan is, is expensive. People don't have money in their grants to do that. Um, what we've done through the uh, generosity of these grants is we've been able to send U.S. leadership outside of the country so they can attend these meetings. And that's been a really important activity because otherwise the U.S. would not be able to be as, as firm of a player in the RDA. So RDA 1 helped us with a number of different things. Um, when we started understanding what the business model would be, we submitted the RDA 2 grant. Uh, which is still ongoing and ends in 2018, and that helps us provide organizational support. It helps pay for the plenaries that are in the U.S. It helps uh, send people to um, RDA meetings. It helps us bring our community together and start pilots, but then uh, turn into programs that people go out and try to get funding for. Um, NIST has been really generous in helping us um, create the data fabric and the, um, and the support from uh, for these coordin coordination meetings. Uh, Sloan, the data share program, is the student program. Um, we worry about sustainability, um, and we're starting to think about that now. I would ask your help in um, several ways. I would ask your help in uh, helping us think through this problem, because what you want is you want a continuing trajectory, and if there are best practices from communities that you come uh, in contact with, if there are ideas that you have, you know, this we have about a three-year runway um, to really make sure that we keep uh, the RDA U.S. activity going and that we can contribute to the international RDA. So any ideas you have are always welcome. All right. 
So let me give you sort of the last uh, on the horizon, what's coming up. Uh, we have uh, more plenaries than you can shake a stick at. Uh, the next plenary will be in Paris, France, and uh, uh, our French hosts are busy trying to create a great uh, data challenge if possible and a great conference if possible, and, um, and we're all making our reservations and, uh, to go, and we've already got the U.S. contingent um, looking for economy airfares uh, so they can get there and, uh, and participate. Um, the plenary after that will be our first one in Asia, and this will be great for um, our um, RDA members in the region. It will be the first time that they don't have to travel tens of hours uh, and that, um, and that um, our Japanese hosts can show off RDA in their country, and they're really looking forward to it already, kind of working on details for that. Um, again, we're already working on details for Plenary 8, September 11th to through 16th, mark your calendars, uh, in Washington, D.C., and we'll be collaborating with CoData and, and ICSU. Um, if you or your communities are interested in co-located meeting, birds of the feather sessions, anything like that, let us know now because the uh, agenda, especially with three different conferences, will get filled up um, quickly. And we want to make sure... You know, of course, we always have a little national pride here. We want to make sure that the plenaries in the U.S. are really useful to the U.S. and really useful to the community. And so we want to make these great plenaries. And uh, so any, any ideas, thoughts, help you have would, would be useful. And finally, uh, my last slide, um, I, I, I was thinking, you know, what should I end with? And, you know, there's the big vision of RDA, but I've been telling you that. And so... Um, I always like my last slide to give concrete things to do. So what if you wake up tomorrow morning and say, gee, I would like to get involved with the RDA. So what could you do? So, uh, so here's, here are various ways of getting involved with the RDA. Um, uh, one way is to join as an individual member. Uh, you're all too polite to go to your email, but you could do this right now. You uh, go to the RDA website. It's free. Uh, you... Um, you agree to be open and uh, and a good person and you know believe in world peace and and you're in. So um, we have our principles are really uh, openness, um, technology neutral, um, and the idea of sort of community sharing. So um, so we welcome uh, members uh, and using RDA is a great vehicle. Um, you can join RDA as an organizational member. So you may have groups that you're part of. Um, that are really interested in that. And um, there's two ways of doing that. You can either join as a member, and that's typically for um, uh, uh, organizations that have uh, some discretionary income that they can provide, uh, and, and or as an affiliate, which takes council approval, because those are for uh, groups like CoData, which don't have a, a budget for that. So CoData is a, um, uh, an RDA affiliate. And um, a lot of people think that the value proposition for being their organization being part of RDA is really, really useful. And, again, there's a, a various uh, thing. Our funders forum is a really important group to us. They're the group that are helping us think through and um, really respond to the need for organizational stability and sustainability, and they're helping us sort of work through all the details for that. We welcome people who would like to join that forum uh, for them and their community and, and just let us know if you're interested. And then on the RDA US side, what we're finding is that many people who want to sort of join um, at a funders forum type level, but it's very important to them that funding stays in region. Um, and that's true for RDA US as well. We have many uh, folks that it's really important to support the US community in RDA and we uh, uh, welcome any kind of interaction around that as well. And so um, myself or Kathy would be um, great people to talk to on that. So those are kind of concrete, if you're interested in RDA, ways to engage. And with that, I really thank you for your patience, your time, and uh, your time away from all the other things you're doing. Oh, thanks.